be a timely discussion on library options. Uh, as you'll recall, the intergovernmental agreement we entered into uh, last January, seems oh so long ago, uh, said that the town had the town had committed to do one of two things uh, in early 2010. Uh, we would either put a ballot initiative on asking for a dedicated library property tax uh, under the presumption that it would be used uh, in some way to continue a relationship with Louisville, or in the alternative we would go to the voters with an alternative library plan of some unknown origin. So what we wanted to do was give ourselves sufficient time to talk about what all the options were, find out what additional information the board might need as you continue to weigh those options, recognizing that if we are going to go to ballot uh, in April 2010, uh, we really need to make that decision by the first meeting in January. So the purpose of the report here, most of it was historical, uh, telling you what we've already, what we've previously done, a lot of historical data included in the appendices, but we laid out what we thought were the five reasonable options. Continue our relationship with Louisville, pursue other governmental partnerships, create a regional authority, establish our own facility, of which there were many sub-options. And the last, well, uh, I don't know that anybody has any interest in it whatsoever, but it's certainly always an option, is to no longer be in the library business or provide access to library services for our residents. So I don't want to read through it, but um, I think I just summarized what the relationship is with Louisville, and you have a, also an attachment one and a copy of the existing IGA, uh, the historical information that the uh, anticipated tax levy of 1.5 mills would generate approximately $240,000 based on current assessed valuations. Uh, talks about what we could do in those, in those continuing uh, dialogues with Louisville and any relationship, whether it's a property tax supported or any other kind of a relationship with Louisville would necessitate a new intergovernmental agreement. The intergovernmental agreement that we have today does expire uh, at the end of 2010. Uh, we, again, have talked uh, endlessly about the other prospects. What I did want to get out here is that, and I did find it interesting, that there are more than 400 public libraries in the state of Colorado, all participating in the uh, library consortium. Uh, we've not chosen to have discussions with anybody other than our immediately adjacent neighbors, but I guess technically any one of them uh, is a viable uh, option. Uh, to get a library card, a library card machine and reciprocity. So I wanted to lay those numbers out and we know who they are. Uh, but you know what the relationships and the, and the uh, positives and ne negatives are of Boulder, Broomfield, and Boulder Valley School District. And I thought the most significant one there is, while there might be some real efficiencies in terms of operating costs, uh, there are some very significant capital costs and it would also include, based on all of our dialogue with Boulder Valley School District, uh, more limited hours of operation. I included the information that was provided to us uh, from the Consortium of Cities on the creation of a regional library authority. Uh, the last discussion, and those of you that are participating on the consortium might have better information, more current information, but it looks like it hasn't been discussed in detail since late 2006, early 2007. Uh, and I do remember a conversation with Ben Perlman saying it died of its own weight because of these couple of reasons, that uh, there was always the issue of how do we deal with those that are existing and the fact that there's no, no contiguity between, between those that aren't existing. So how do we deal with the Niwat Lions and Superior Partnership Coalition? Um, establishing our own facility, and that's probably the most logical and viable alternative. Uh, and what we tried to do was lay out here what, the, what some of the options were. Uh, we talked specifically about sites, both uh, land and buildings. Uh, both existing and prospective, and I don't want to get anybody's hackles up over over some of the potentials, but uh, the idea of talking about additional land acquisition, or is this a suitable use for Richmond 11 adjacent to Eldorado K8, but we tried to be as thorough as, we, as possible. And as the source of most of this, we went back and looked at a surplus real estate report that we'd given the board a little over a year ago. and said, these are some viable sites. There are a couple of sites that probably, while we do own them, wouldn't be realistic either because of their location, their configuration, and the like. You didn't go into great detail about costs because until you come up with a parameter, um, it's difficult to say. I would, I would give you I'd give you advice that says to build a new building, 
it's going to cost you probably 200 bucks a square foot. Uh, whether you decide it to be a 3,000 or a 10,000 or a 20,000, uh, it's difficult to talk about total costs and budget implications and debt and all of those kinds of things until you develop some parameters. But $200 a square foot would be a reasonable cost. Operating costs, likewise, we've given you some historical studies that staff had done uh, when the last ballot initiative was put together back in 2006. But again, those would depend on building size, inventory size, and hours of operation. If you decided to go with a very limited after school and weekend uh, versus having a traditional 10-hour uh, operating day, six or seven day a week. So very, very big variables. But I hope you found that the information helpful so that we could at least start the, the conversation and then get to the point of saying this would be additional information that, we, we, you know, that the board would find very helpful as we try to ratchet down the options and come to a decision. Lisa. So um, this is a really interesting issue for me I, I'm, and for the whole board. And I did I I took up um, I took the mayor of Erie up on an offer he made some time ago to take a tour of the library that they have in Erie. And mostly I wanted to discuss the process that they've gone through because they started out small and then went bigger. And I thought that had a lot of you know resonance with where we might possibly be considering. And so um, I took a tour and. He showed me the building. The way they started out was they had, you know, some interested citizens, and they had a little plot of land, and um, in a residential neighborhood, and they went to um, and and some small business, some small pastoria or something, had a building they weren't going to use anymore, and so they moved the building onto this little plot of land, and then volunteers like you know respackled or whatever. Anyway, anyway, it's smaller than 2,000 square feet. I'm going to say it was more like. 1,500 square feet. It was a pretty small little house, sort of one floor um, type thing, and they put a children's library in there, along with some, um, you know, computer terminals. And they operated that for several years. I'm going to say on the order of six or seven years, maybe a little longer than that. I could be wrong. But maybe some of you know better. But in any case, that's about what it was. It was an. It was not a, a neighborhood that was designed for commercial sort of stuff. It was, you know, you had on-street parking is all just, you know, like like a neighborhood that sort of thing. And um, that operated for several years and was very popular. And they had a lot of volunteers that were sort of staffing it. Um, they may have had a librarian as well. I've been trying to clarify that. But in any case, it was fairly straightforward. When they they decided that they had something, I'm not going to say dissimilar to what we've got, in that they had they were thinking about a library, but then they had a neighbor that was like had a library and was being a little bit stiff about how, how it was going to be used. All that, this, you know, Coffee, and all that sort of stuff, right? You know, it makes sense. So there are some similarities to where we're coming from, and um, they ultimately, uh, and they were able, and they had this, they had this thing, Weld County Library District. Well, Weld County Library District was meant to be in Weld County, and they, they had to go to the state, I think it was, to get, maybe um, Mayor Moore talked to you about this, the state or someplace to get some language to allow that library district to go outside of Weld County to cover the other half of Erie, which is now in Boulder County. That has some interesting op options for us because it's possible that if that library district is now called High Plains Library District, it's possible that that can extend to other places in Boulder County, like maybe oh, us. Maybe right. it doesn't have to be contiguous. It's not clear, and, and I haven't approached them about it, but that was something that the mayor and I talked about for, for a moment, and, and he said he would be willing to investigate it if we were in, at all interested. But given that Boulder County's library system is kind of not dead in the water, but a real hard start because all the major players have already got their own individual little library systems and have very little to gain by sort of doing this. Um, maybe a way, to st a, a way to get into a library system that's more, you know, um, inclusive or whatever is, is looking at this other option. One of the other things, um, I, now I understand from the past that there was also, there's also this sort of, uh, Jeff Chu was talking to me about this, is it the li Colorado Library something that was only several thousand dollars a year to join or something? Mm -hmm. In any case, that's another possible thing. But they, he, he would be willing to come and talk to us, the, the mayor of Erie, about this sort of process, but also how important he thought it was for establishing a town's identity and being part of becoming sort of a, a next level town in a sense. He's very charismatic. I think you know he's he, a great he, guy. he really speaks. Yeah, a great he's, guy. He, and he and he's got a lot to say about also sort of leaving behind baggage and things like that, and mm -hmm. and using the opportunities. And and I think it's it's he it was a very um, fun meeting and I spoke with their librarian also and in any case I think that they have a lot of lessons to potentially they, they were at a similar situation and they went with a, a small children's library first as a storefront basically and then and then as time moved on 
established, uh, went into this system that costs them about $100 per household per year for the property taxes for this library system. And that's not cheap. It's a fair chunk of change, but they also get um, books delivered the next day, and, and it's a really, really nice library. It's all flat, really open, you know, one floor, really open windows and children's park that's very that um, really engaging. Nice you can see the whole yeah. thing so mm -hmm. that it feels very friendly, not very walled off and dark and whatever, which is, you know, and not two stories and not over necessarily. Um, I got a lot out of that visit, and I know that he, they would be happy to, you know, entertain anybody else visiting as well, and he would be willing to come here and talk to us about it. I would be interested in hearing mm -hmm. more from him and going and visiting and seeing him. I think he has a lot, a lot of uh, uh, lessons to uh, provide. What, what it made me, it sort of reinforced in me what, what I had thought was that maybe in the short term we look at a children's type, smallish library, and we ultimately grow when we when town center or something else becomes the right time to, to, to expand. And by that I, time, the people will be used, on board, yeah, right. be more interested in actually footing the bill for it. Potentially, and I think, but we still need to go soon for that for that for some funding. Right. So I did some back of the envelope calculations. The, the web is an amazing thing, right? And so <laughs> I went on the web, and it turns out like there are these documents from all over the places, including one from Wisconsin. It's like you know multipliers to start your library or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> it was pretty amazing. Uh, you know, if your population is this, and you know, find out your number of children, and then multiply and. and 40% of a collection in a lot of these libraries is apparently children's library um, collection. 5% teen and 55% adult. That really surprised me, that proportion. So I didn't realize how much libraries were all about kids. So I worked out some figures. And to, to, to start a collection, to, to sort of do a whole collection that would be support, that would support sort of our town, would be about 140 k for the books. And that's assuming like 20 bucks a book. It seemed high to be conservative for me. To, for children's books. Are they really 20 bucks a piece? I don't know. But anyway, yeah. so anyway, um, if we did that, the stock, it would cost about 140 k and we wouldn't have to do that in one year. We could do that for two years mm -hmm. or whatever. The new books um, are about 11 k a year, so that's not a huge expense ongoing. We could certainly ask for donations as well. From I think there would be a lot of that. Oh, yeah. My son is actually doing a his Eagle project for scouting and collecting books for underprivileged kids. Oh. Yeah. And donations Excellent. Yeah. 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 Then I looked also at, you know, I did these multipliers about how much space you need and all that jazz, and it seemed like 2,000 square feet was enough for a children's library plus two or three computer centers plus a librarian space and whatever, you know, the workspace that's needed for librarians. So 2,000 2, square feet, and at the rental rates that we have here in town, that's approximately $36,000 a year in a storefront. Now, that's not kind of the avoided revenues that we get. So we'd lose some revenues as well from, well, I guess if we were paying rent, we'd get the revenues. But anyway. I don't the sales the taxes. no no sales tax revenues but I don't know anyway the it, it's not it wasn't outrageous costs and then a librarian costs something and um, it's unclear how much of the staff time you have to be librarian versus volunteer versus mm -hmm. these have librarian assistants and they have librarian you know clerks or whatever all these different categories of people I thought something like that seemed quite doable and it seemed I was pretty enthused about about that op that kind of opportunity and going forward with maybe a ballot, and this you know, not a done decision, but looking, investigating a, a ballot issue that would say, we're going to collect money for sort of a long-term library. In the short term, immediately we're going to establish a small library. That collection will move over to a new facility when, when that new facility gets, gets established, but that we start um, accumulating the funds you need to, to start a library um, soon. So, um, while we're doing that, what does that mean, though, for adults who want to use a library? Will we have bought into a system? I think that's what we would we would want to do, and whether that's the, the broader Colorado thing, or that's not so expensive apparently, or a library district, we need to investigate the library district option. So there would be, so at least we would um, have some options. Oh, I think while that's critical. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, just a little bit more. No, thank you. That's great. It was fun. And, and um, I should say also that I apologize because I don't know if anybody caught that Boulder Camera article that came out while I was gone, but they called me up on a weekend when I was on Orcas and said, so me too. what about a, a you know library? And, and, and I gave them the pros and the cons, and they decided to only print one half of those. So, <laughs> you know, what are you going to do? I, I apologize. I, didn't, I was trying to be quite balanced and not bruise some, any neighbors, uh, you know, whatever, but... That's not the way the article chose to come out. Anyway, thanks. So as I'm looking at the options that you have here, Scott, I would mm -hmm. you 
put in a hierarchy, I would say that establishing a town of superior facility would be my number one option, with number two being continuing the relationship with the city of Louisville. And then, uh, so that's, you know, like what you said, Lisa, so I think based on what you said, that makes, to me, a lot of sense, a first step approach, maybe a couple of years, three or four years, and then just things. Just change. a reminder that we're, uh, our new communication strategy is that we're uh, not saying that televising it. Okay. So if you need to speak into a mic for oh, oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Well, I can repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be my first option is establishing a facility here in Superior. I think that it says a lot about a town to have a library um, of our own. So and if there's a way to do that that's fiscally responsible and we can do it in the short term and expand later on out before that. Other thoughts from anybody? Well, I, I certainly would like to see the further investigation of what Lisa was talking about. Um, when we made our decision last year, or earlier this year, I guess it was, I think it was clear that our best choice for the most services was to continue a relationship with Louisville. That's sort of where my head's still at now. Although I like to see Superior have its own library, I want to be convinced that we can present it in a in a method that a, a ballot would pass, and I wouldn't want to mess up our relationship with Louisville if if it wasn't a sh look didn't look very good to have that pass because um, I think what we get from Louisville for the price is still a very good option. And I should say that one of the reasons that I that I like the idea of pursuing, I, I think Louisville is, is a good option right now, and I but the price will change. Um, the the one thing I like about having a children's library in town is I like the fact that children could walk to it, or could bike to it, or you know rollerblade or whatever they do, and <laughs> they can't do that in Louisville, Boulder, Broomfield, or any of the other um, options. That's a good point. Uh, so. I think I've said in the past that I you know, love libraries. I love walking through the stacks, smelling the must, all that kind of stuff. I'm not convinced that libraries are in the future. Uh, you know, I read my New York Times recently where you know textbooks are going away because they're all going on the Kindle or whatever. Um, and so but they can be deleted. But they can be deleted <laughs> if you have uh, 1984. It's, it was very Orwellian. <laughs> um, so, you know, the question is whether or not we would want to have a ca big capital construction campaign to build a building because eventually people are not going to want a storefront um, then to realize that everything's going to be electronic in the future and then what are we going to do with the building. So I'm a little hesitant about that. I tend to agree that I think we get very good bang for our buck uh, cooperating with Louisville. It makes that library better as opposed to having two smaller libraries that potentially aren't as good. Uh, so um, I don't think that I've, I'm always open to new options, but I'm not sure that uh, changing from the Louisville option right now is, um, makes sense, at least in my mind. I you know, would love to hear more and understand these things more, but I'd, I'd be a little cautious about jumping whole, whole cloth into a new adventure. I think it's important to have a gathering place I know everything is electronic, but I was uh, reading an article last week about Paneras. Not that I'm going to promote any establishment here in Superior. <laughs> and how they've been able to be more successful than any other restaurant chain in the United States when everybody's losing money right now because nobody's going out to eat. And besides the fact that they've had, obviously, fresh products, they have the bakery, I mean, they have a great variety of healthy foods. Coffee. Coffee, <laughs> food sweets and so on. The primary reason for their success, according to their CEO, is that it has become a place, an establishment where people get together and they sit. For and, they can, and they can do for business meetings, yeah. they can go there by themselves and they can have free access to the internet. They can just hang out and that place doesn't exist and there's quality of food, quality of service and just a hanging out place. So I still think there's a, a need for people in the community to get together and so I'm... Uh, I'm very interested in exploring your ideas. <laughs> and for that reason alone, I, I know everything's going electronic, but there's still there's something about special about gathering together and reading and 
the question is whether whether or not that would have to be a library or or some other facility. Well, and I, and I think that's a, a real valid question. That, and the issue of whether or not a big library in the long term makes sense al is always a, a question I, d I don't know. And I think that this is a is a not not jump there option necessarily. And it, it has some great opportunities for sort of drawing people to some places we want to draw them anyway, and where they're coming anyway, and all that sort of thing. So I think it provides some real bennies that way as well. So I, I would like to see this work. I'm assuming that uh, we are I'm going to take it for granted that we're going out to ballot in April for the property tax mill levy. Yes. General and not to that effect. Where that money is going to be uh, given to Louisville at least for a while, mm -hmm. is it postulated that you would anticipate a bigger property tax mill levy to jumpstart a library here or? I think, that's what we have that to, I think that's what we have to decide if we're going to if we're going to suggest the bond levy, the bond mm -hmm. to go with Louisville, then that's one level. If we're going to suggest right. it as something independent, that's a different level. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the whole, the whole question. Yeah. Yeah. We need to ask for those questions. Uh -huh. And this is getting back to what my comment was of making our ballot question very clear, mm -hmm. so that we. People know what they're voting on and making a choice. Do uh, so you think about two issues on the ballot? No, I think we, we're choosing what our what we want the ballot issue to be, and making that clear. I mean, if you made it two, I think that adds to confusion. I think it'd be hard. Yeah, but I think we have to know what we're asking for, and not just talk about. Well, and you know, we talked about it earlier. Though, the, the library services question without defining it. That didn't work. Yeah, That's right. Work. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> so I just want to understand then how would we do this if we are, um, we would only give one choice saying that we're looking to do something here in town and if okay, that's what our discussion comes well, I think it amounts to what size mill levy we're going to ask for. And not ask whether people can rather continue using those bills. Well, we might have to explain the difference, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think I'd rather just put that um, on the ballot. I mean, I understand the point about it, it being too confusing, and we have to be very clear about it, but I, I think there's also, um, again, that whole sort of, if we say library and superior, and they say no, does that mean then, then what do we assume? That that means that they don't want any library services, even with Louisville? Mm -hmm. So I think we need to make sure that we... Um, Allow, allow the option that library services in town or library services continue with this bill. I think it's important. To I think we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves, but unfortunately, in a ballot, you're not. You don't have the ability to place options. Uh, if you went forward with a, would you support a 1.5 mil levy for continuation of library service agreements with the city of Louisville? You put another one on there that said, pick a number. Would you support a mill levy of X to support the creation of a superior library? And for for the moment, presume that they both passed. You have two property taxes. That's a big problem. You can't ask twice. Yeah, we have to help. So you can't. You have to decide what it right. is you want to put forward. Right. Exactly. So my suggestion, whatever you decide, be clear because the issue that failed in 2006, and I wasn't here for it, but I, I've, I've been told that it failed because of the lack of clarity. Right. Thanks. Thanks, thanks for saying what I've been trying to say. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. I think you're right. I think that's we all exactly agree. It. Yeah, we all, and that's what we just said. Yeah. yeah. So there's no way to write on a ballot. Um, Not a reference. Pick A or B. No. You, you can't pick A or B. You can't do that. Okay. You talk, that's a survey. That's is that in Tabor laws? Is that how that works? There's very strict, uh, I mean, there's strict ballot language, you know. Uh, by re I, I can't read. At one time, I think I could reread re it, but, you know, as for, you know, by generating X, Y, you know, this amount of, with the property tax, but, you know, there's a whole paragraph that you have to start out for Tabor questions. So, Can you, I mean, you could have, a, you could have okay. two separate questions. But, if but then again, pass. if you both pass, then you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. Well, so could we could we maybe um, invite Mayor Moore to come and talk to us? Is that something that people would be interested in hearing, or not? Absolutely. I, I, would, I see no harm in that. I think that would enlighten at least the other side of it. I think that. Uh, I guess um, I'd like to understand uh, what the transition period to say that we were going to go ahead with building a library in Superior, I guess it would be 
people to understand what that transition would look like. That because Louisville, obviously, if we don't, if we're not sending them money, they're going to say we're back to not providing any no library service. services at all. So we've got to um, figure out if we've got to um, we join a library district or what we do for library services. If we join a district, we can go to any library that's in that district, and we can order books from that district to be delivered to whatever we mm -hmm. establish. I think building the library components are important, but I don't think building a building is what we're talking about here. Yeah. I would not support that well, at this time. You have to have a place to put the books in, though. Right, and it would have to be an existing structure. A storefront or, yeah. or a home. I mean, to me, that's small potatoes, starting at the, the very bottom and working your way up until the voters say, yes, I want a complete facility. But that, that's my thoughts. And it has to have an online component. It okay. absolutely must. I, I of course. feel that it's important that you should be able to order the books that you want and have those books delivered to that mm -hmm. particular library and go down and get them. Whether you're an adult, a child, I mean, even if you started as a children's library, I can still, as an yes. adult, order those books I want and go down there and get them. So I want to. I need clarity yeah. that we're yeah. being bantered about this evening. So next steps are are which? I think additional fact finding on the on the local option. And the facts I once I, I don't mean to be hammering a huh. dead horse here. What 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 is the what are the pieces of information that we need to understand to be able to make a decision so that we can costs, whether there's a library district that we could join or how we would go about getting shared books and Facility? Facility options, yeah. One other one other critical aspect is what level of service you want. Yeah. Um, I've, he I've heard what you said so far in terms of a priority for establishing local library capacity. Uh, whether it's a storefront, whether it's a home, whether it's an existing building or something that gets put up on the cheap in order to accommodate it. Are we looking for something that has traditional hours of operation or eight a traditional hours of operation? I.e., if it's going to be geared predominantly to those of school age, doesn't need to be open from nine to nine to noon. Right. 182 days a year. So I guess that that would help if you if you gave us some guidance along those lines. We we can look it up at the facility options. We can look at the staffing staffing and. Um, inventory options and we can look at the reciprocity options uh, as I understand the Colorado Library Consortium there's a threshold to become a member you don't just pay four thousand dollars to become a member Boulder County Sheriff as I shared with you before is a member because they maintain a library we don't want to be a part of that library because of where it's located but they're a member because they maintain an infrastructure staff and those kinds of things that's the criteria and then there's a cost for that and once you're in that consortium, you can get books from anywhere. It's not a district membership. It's not Weld County. It's not that particular facility. Yeah, sure. They're going to come from somewhere within that consortium. So do we know that uh, that price level? I mean, price level that's included in the stuff that was done back in 2006, I believe, was $55,000. Yearly? Yes. And what kind of level of service is that? I mean, carte blanche of any book you want? I, I don't. I couldn't don't know enough about it but I can tell you being a member in Louisville right now I've had books on order for six weeks that I haven't been able to get because the waiting list was too long that just it's first come first serve but that's a different issue no. it's availability. I want, I want, those, I want a book books are coming from it's the same. we're talking availability and that I mean I wouldn't call that level of service that is service, though. Well, it, if you have to wait for six weeks to get something, that is. It's the same. I don't know. It depends on what book you're asking for. I mean, so it could be the the bestseller of 2009. I mean, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I think there's a lot of issues there. So, it sounds like. Well, and on the hours thing, hours of operation. Mm -hmm. I think you can come back to with, with us with us with, you know, if we want it 12 hours a day, it's this. If you want it six hours a day, it's that. I mean, that's. It. I can't make a decision until I know the cost. My bill builders always want to say, well, do you want the granite or this? And you say, well, tell me the cost, and then I can tell you. So kind of, it's a pretty easy calculation to, to modify, and if we could just know a couple of options, we can hone in on where we're thinking. Well, 
And do we know the users, um, how it's broken down as far as those that are using Louisville Library? Um, in other words, I'm guessing that it's the same as what the national ones, the majority are, are, are children going over there, but do, do we have any idea? Um, I've never seen any of the breakout based on their utilization of what so we don't either have age breakout or... I was wondering if, if we're looking for, you know, preschool age children more to get it started, then that's going to change the hours operation as well versus... Right. The they can tell us what the card holders are, but they can't tell us, you know, whether, whether mom takes out six books for... Whether it's children's books that are being checked out yeah. or adult books. That's, I mean, without knowing that information, it's a little hard to gear this library towards mm -hmm. the high end or the majority user. How do you gear the library towards the majority user if you don't know the majority user at this point? Well, but, but the national stats say the collection is 40% for kids, 5% mm -hmm. for teen, whatever, and 55% for adults. And we go with that and see how it goes. No, we, I don't think we would include the adult collection. We'd let that be what's ordered online. So you're talking just the children's? That's what I was talking yeah. about. Kind of following the model of the year, basically. Mm -hmm. So using the national standards to, to as a springboard to figure out where to go from there. Given that we can't get any better data locally, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I, I that's can't imagine where that is are. Yeah. I mean, that, that's somewhere to start uh, compared to zero. Well, in fact, it, we're probably even skewed younger because we are a much younger community. Average household age are we? is much younger than the national average. Yeah. We have average ho higher average household family sizes. <coughs> And we have an average lower, uh, a lower average age than national averages. Could so I think that would tie into it would be geared more towards a younger audience. But whether that's well, that's four to six, four to six, uh, you know, under teens, teens. Yeah. Could we ask the mayor of the year to come at our next meeting? I think that'd be great. Next Should work session, available? next meeting, next work session, yeah. We, do like we, could, a, we could certainly extend the invitation. We don't have anything for that workshop agenda. Let's do it. I would like that. Sounds great. Okay. What other information would you like to see? Would you like to see a couple of pro forma on a, some operating assumptions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one in particular that, I mean, I think there's, there's a certain level of staffing you can't go below. And that can, I wouldn't encourage you, as an example, to rely upon volunteers to operate a right. library. I'm thinking you need to have probably 1.5 FTEs but, uh, for any kind of operation. But if you if you can figure out a way to do it on a children's library just open in the daytime, one FTE, I, that gives you no slack at all if that person's sick or anything. Will your research include um, different... Um, Structures as options. I don't know. You've got in here a uh, Coal Creek Firehouse. Is that, you have that right? I was list, listing through the litany of surplus property, real estate, and structures that we have. Okay. Um, and as far as that, um, and I'm guessing that, say, a home that's, um, I don't know, in foreclosure right now, we can't put this in. Um, Based on um, zoning in a in a residential neighborhood, or or would that be HOA regulations that say we can't do that? What would be HOA wouldn't Might prevent not be the town from no, doing something? Scott, are you kidding? What yeah. about original town? Our zoning is more of an issue. I mean, I think any resident would have a right to complain if the town decided to put a library next to their house with all the parking oh, and everything yeah. else. What about back well, here? Or yeah. over can there, you, you know? that's, that a can you give me the that's status of the Coal Creek Fire Station? What? Uh, it is currently used by Rocky Mountain Fire Protection District. They pay us rent for the ability to store equipment there. It is also used by our Parks and Rec Department, uh, both for storage as well as operations of the field crews. But the field crews account represent three people, so it's not insurmountable. That's why I placed it down here as an option. Likewise, I mean, conceivably, if you said we wanted to start quick and in as inexpensively as possible, uh, I think we'd even had some discussion and said what would it equate what would it cost to equip this room <coughs> as a study cartel and stacks. You know, and whether this space is eight hundred square feet, I think I might have said two thousand at the last, but whatever it is, you know, what would it cost to 
to to convert this uh, this space into something that was more publicly accessible. I mean, or what would it take to do a 2,400 square foot vacancy at Superior Marketplace, or a 2,400 mm -hmm. square foot prospective vacancy at Rock Creek Village? Uh, I've heard comments about accessibility. Candidly, I don't know that the Superior Marketplace would be the most convenient place for youngsters to be getting in and out of. And I priced the the Safeway Park um, that one, that mm -hmm. shopping mall. Unfortunately, after today, with the new Rock Creek Pizza opening, there aren't any vacancies. I was just going to ask what's the availability right now. Nothing. Zero. Today, zero. In some ways, that's good. Probably, yeah. I think Unleashed is open. That's what um, I saw online. Is not Unleashed leaving? There. We've heard that they were being wooed to move to to Louisville. If you look online, it's there. They had a. They're operating. They are. Today. They had a for lease sign out here or something. Uh -huh. But um, yeah. as far as locations, the. Um, El Dorado, next to El Dorado, that property, the um, school site, park. school site, Moose Richmond Island Eleven, Island right? Park. That that's a possibility, though, right? I mean, as far as a town, you know, governmental agreement and everything else, building something. Mm -hmm. you mean? If we were to build a structure, mm -hmm. we could. That no, certainly would be one of the ones that was listed here. Certainly. Mm -hmm. Okay. That could be expensive. And that's listed as well. Oh, right. I agree. Yeah. It'd be expensive, but I'm just saying, as so, far as locations. So to sort of rip up. To pro forma for operations and an invitation to the mayor of Erie to attend the meeting in two weeks. Yes. And whether or not there's a whether or not there's a consortium, I mean a library district that, that we can join us. As I said, there's four hundred of them, but but no, that's a different question. Not, yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to. I don't want to do something crazy, decision. right? Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, what, the, what the criteria is for participation in a consortium, Something which gives us reciprocity, yeah. so that we don't have to have an inventory that consists of all things for all people on day one. I guess I'd have some concern about, you know, uh, talking to Grand Junction about whether or not we want to join their <laughs> library district. It just doesn't seem like that's a fair thing to do. We need to do something that it was falls within the realm of reason, which but the is something in the front range. So you very much so. Yeah. We had talked during our negotiations with uh, with Louisville that the prospect of going to a place like Central City or Blackhawk, which both have libraries, and saying, what, what will it cost us to get a library card machine that is good for any library anywhere within the state? And it probably wouldn't be the $115,000 we are paying this year. But you're right. There's an equity issue. There's a... Right. Because they're going to, you know, at, at the end of the day, unless the building is big enough that people want to go and sit at, we don't, they're probably not going to sit for a whole long time over in the marketplace. They're still going to go over to Louisville, right, to use that building probably. And does it make sense for us to say, well, you know, and, 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 uh, you know, we're going someplace else and tough nuggy to you and we're going to use your building. I, you know, I have a little bit of concern about that, mm -hmm. so. I think the equity issue is not just a minor component that we need to think about. Unless we're going to provide services here that are the level of services <coughs> that we're talking about, which I think is going to be more than 1.5 mils realistically generating 240. I mean, because that's not going to build any building. It's going to pay some rent and <coughs> a little bit of FTE. It's going to be a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. So, <coughs> But it would be good to understand those things. Okay. So, All right. All right, well, with the nini 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 comment, let's uh, <laughs> move to the solar installation update. Matt, you want to? The sun's been out, Matt. Yeah, it's good. Thing. That's good. Mm -hmm. well, uh, Matt and I, we count staff. Well, I'm glad <coughs> to say that our five um, solar installations on our the five buildings, the two pools, <coughs> town hall, parks office, and the fire station on Cole Creek is complete. Um, wrapping up some minor things with those five systems, including the um, monitoring system and uh, some Excel rebate paperwork that we have to fill out and get completed. But um, they're up and operating, and I think they look good. They look really nice, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it was good. We debated whether to put them on the pools now or until after the pools were closed. We decided to go ahead and do it while they were open, and I think it was a good idea. Um, with that, we've started work on the design for the two systems 
at the treatment plants. Uh, originally, as you know, we were talking about um, 99 kilowatts of size systems there because that's what our limitations were as far as rebates from Excel. Excel has recently announced uh, that they're going to implement um, increased size allowance for the medium category, which these would fall under, up to 500 kilowatts. So uh, with that, we, we thought it was beneficial to go ahead and start designing for larger sizes systems there because we have the we have the ground space available for that. Um, so I wanted to show you a couple of pictures of what those are going to look like. Just for reference, uh, this is the water treatment plant here, and this was what was originally designed uh, at the water treatment plant for 99 kilowatts. Uh, and this is what we're looking at now for a 466 kilowatt size system. Originally we uh, had some panels down here and we thought not a good idea. One, it's a longer distance to the, to the, for the trenching work and we thought the impact to the ridge was not a good idea. So we have um, quite a bit of space up here so we moved the panels up to the north. So the ridge shouldn't We've, we've talked to the Ridge HOA and let them know, showed them some diagrams, and I think they're comfortable with them, not going to be able to see them from where they're located. Um, so it's going to be a good system, good size system. We've maximized the, the size of the system we can put up there with the ground space available, and we can have some on the building also um, that you'll be able to see from the roadway. And then for the water treatment plant, this is what was originally planned uh, for the 99 kilowatt size system. We kept everything that's on the buildings, um, and then we had this little piece, it's not little, but a smaller piece on the hillside here. Uh, this is Saddlebrook, or yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, Saddlebrook here. And then and, uh, we're going to go to you can see we've used almost this entire hillside here now to the north of the wastewater treatment plant to get uh, a 365 kilowatt size system. These two systems, as they're designed now, and there's some minor tweaking that we have to do, but will generate just under 1.2 million kilowatt hours a year, just these two systems alone, which is a huge, huge production. For the water treatment plant, Can you try to do that into dollars and cents. Uh, well, the the the, the cost of systems have in increased significantly. Um, they went from somewhere in the range of I think it was seven hundred thousand plus dollars to five million. Right. Um, so we're looking at financing options for these now, um, but um, our total electrical consumption last year was five hundred thousand dollars no renewable energy. 35% after these installations. The original scenarios that we showed you with seven installations, five rooftop and two ground, 13% right. of our bill. 13% cost avoidance. This will get us up to about 35% of local generation capacity. Now that doesn't reduce your bill by 35% because as you've just gone through in the solar debate, Excel recently, we still need to pay a peak demand charge we still need to pay a transmission charge mm -hmm. and recognize we're using a lot of power over and above what we're able to generate. So there will be some bills. But to put it in perspective, we're generating a third of our $500,000 annual utility bill. And what's the payback? 20 years? 30 years? Well, until we know what the cost is of the final system. Oh. We're not proposing that we invest $5 million in ground-mounted solar. We're exploring the other alternatives, which include third-party purchase agreements, mm -hmm. um, a number of alternatives, because we, we don't have the wherewithal. And candidly, no, a $5 million investment on a, even on a $500,000 or $300,000 annual return would be almost a 20-year payback. It doesn't make sense to do it on an economic model. Right. What's the lifespan of these things? Well, the warranties for, the warranties um, go 
20 to 25 years okay. on the panels right. themselves. And there's one small part that's maybe got a shorter lifetime, but what yeah, it's the uh, the converters, it's the plug, right? <laughs> they and those have a 10 year warranty, and um, so, but uh, on a third party financing, all the maintenance cost is with that company. So we buy the, the power that the panels produce at a set cost at, with a set uh, accelerator uh, for whatever number of years we decide. So, Is there any way to see how much we would save over time? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, especially depending on how it gets structured. You know, if, we went, if we went to market and, and invested $5 million and then took that 100, 100 or one and a quarter million kilowatt off, the, off of our use, we could calculate that and it would have a very high payback period. What our hope is, is the power purchase agreement. Right now, if we're paying seven and a half cents a kilowatt hour for conventional power through Excel, and through this power purchase agreement, whatever we generate, we buy from our third party purchaser for, and for discussion's sake, let's say five cents a kilowatt hour. We can calculate very easy what those savings are. We're still buying the rest conventionally. Um, but the third party pur purchase agent gets the benefit of all the tax credits, which we don't get. They obviously get the Excel credits. We don't get, you know, pay taxes, so we don't get it. the benefit of the tax credit. It doesn't benefit the municipality. So that's the, that's why these things have been structured as such. Mm -hmm. All of this has to come back. Matt's been doing the yeoman's job negotiating this with uh, the preferred uh, provider at this point, assuming we can come up with a satisfactory agreement. What was your target, October? Mm -hmm. To come <laughs> forward with all of that. Uh, but I would say on, on the front, it wouldn't make sense for a, from an economic model, it wouldn't make sense for us to incur this investment. Your payback's going to be 20 plus years. 37 more like. And you're, you know, one, the benefit here is you're buying your electricity from a renewable energy source. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is, right. Um, one of our goals. Yep. I do have a question on, um, as far you were talking about um, government um, discounts with um, taxes, but what about, are there any um, upfront type of programs, federal or state? Uh, so there's the stimulus money out there. Yeah. Um, the state has $9 million that's available for small local governments and nonprofits. Oh, they've only made $525,000 available for these types of projects. Um, so uh, that's out there and we would only get a percentage of that. Mm -hmm. And then there's a two million dollar grant opportunity possibly that we could apply for. The problem with that is we could apply for the full two million. There's no guarantee we'd get that. Um, and they're not going to um, have funding available until next year. And we had a target of trying to get these things installed this year, get them up and running, so that would delay any Even because we were so disappointed. We've been waiting for the last couple of months for the governor's energy office to announce their grant program. Right. First of September, they announced the program. That's when we found out that there's only nine and a half million that was available through this discretionary pool. It was going to be divided up six different ways. The first announcement said that municipalities within entitlement counties are not eligible. Boulder County is an entitlement county, so therefore municipalities would not be eligible. We appealed that. They changed the rules. Huh. We're at least eligible to apply now, but I mean, it's nothing for the scale of, of, of this magnitude. In fact, we've recently had discussions as recently as today with uh, the governor's office and Sam Mamet at CML about going directly to Washington through to the congressional delegation and the vice president who's heading up the stimulus funds and saying, this is exactly what you wanted to see. Right. Let us be one of your demonstration because don't, I mean, don't some of these things need to get used? And if nobody else is ready, I mean, we are, yeah. well, I don't know if you can use the term shovel ready on this type of project. But they, they made the ready. largest yeah. portion of that $9 Same. million available to commercial and residential property owners. And then retrofitting on the western slope. Yeah. I mean, when we saw how, this, how the $9.5 million was being divvied up and targeted away from metropolitan areas, um, it was discouraging. Is, yeah. there, is this type of um, system and project possible to work up to it? 
over time, or does it have to be now or not at all? Can you install part of it, you mean? Can, can uh, you work well, up to the final The goal? third party financing, they, well, you, you can't, you're not able to get third party financers involved until it hits a certain Size. dollar amount to make it worth their while. So uh, initially when we were looking at the 299KW, we couldn't get anybody interested. Now that we're at this scale, we're able to third party finance it if we want to. Um, Is there somewhere in between, though? Not yeah, financing. yeah. I mean, originally we talked level. about um, installing the 299KW systems and then over time increasing the size at the sites. Um, your costs go up because you're doing it over phases rather than all at once. Uh, but yeah, you could do that. But it would cost more in phases than it would be. Just yeah, because you got mobilization, you know, two, three, four times whatever it takes. Um, the uh, same meter is only eligible for one Excel rebate. Right. So if we we did a, a system, say a hundred kW system at one of our facilities, and then came back with a larger system later, the fact that they already paid us for a rebate on the smaller system, they would not pay us a rebate on the larger. So we've designed these to maximize our eligibility to try to reduce the, if you will, the per kilowatt capital cost, recognizing the total dollar cost is going up, but we're trying to maximize all of those opportunities. We'll come back to you with the financing plan, obviously, but we wanted to share with you, one, the graphic illustration, it's a significantly greater use of land, uh, land area than previously seen. And the price tag is going to be different. But. And on the wastewater treatment plant, uh, I didn't mention, but we contacted Saddle Brooks HOA also. Let's share this with them. And with these panels on the south facing roof lines and on the hill here, we don't feel that any of the homeowners at Saddle Brook are going to be able to see these panels either. You have to look hard and look over yeah, the yeah, original in order yeah. to see them. You will see them from the trails, and obviously, you'll see them if and when Community Park East disc golf and all of that mm -hmm. comes. Uh, and the yeah, <laughs> water treatment plant facility um, system generates will generate 120 percent of what the building uses. And uh, we don't have much time, but uh, any update about wind power? No. Uh, Paul recently submitted an application for clean renewable energy bonds, um, just preparing in case uh, we get a site or project that we can link to. There's a number of, we've been, I've been looking at a number of projects that are out there, but nothing as of yet. And as you know, I've been participating in the local energy execs program through the NREL National Labs down in Golden uh, and have raised the prospect with the National Laboratory of our interest in doing some sort of a partnership. They generally, they're interested in partnerships and that's not a dead or closed discussion, uh, but they're more of a testing demonstration laboratory and I offered that we would even have interest in helping pay for some of the major installations if we could tap into the power that was being generated through those installations and uh, it's 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 a little bit unique what we're proposing but I think we've gotten their interest so we hope to have something more coming from you but that's a much greater one yeah. we did have discussions with Excel about just buying a wind turbine on their next farm and they weren't overly enthused no, about they weren't. <laughs> governmental partnerships they had talked about a program that they are working on for municipalities and other organizations to to partner with, but they decided that wasn't worth mm. All right. Well, very good work. Thank you so much, and I uh, look forward to the next uh, iteration and understanding. Thanks. Thanks for all your hard research. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, meeting coming up here. Uh, why don't we take a couple minute break and uh, as is what we normally do we'll put the rest of it during the town manager's report. Sounds great. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Welcome, everybody. I'd like to call to order a regular meeting of the Town of Superior Board of Trustees. And Phyllis, if you'd call the roll. Sure. Uh, Mayor mm -hmm. Andy Muckle. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Lisa Skuma. Here. Trustees Joe Sproley. Here. Dana DeSouza. Here. Amy Gagoris. Here. Eric Rosenfeld. Deborah Williams. Here. Town Manager Scott Randall. Here. Town Attorney Kendra Carberry. Here. Town Clerk Phil Sardin. Here. Trustee Rosenfeld sends his regrets that he has a work conflict. Uh, item number three, approval of the agenda. Are there any changes to tonight's agenda? I can ask questions, though, correct? Mm hmm Okay. Okay. Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Motion by Trustee Gergurus, second by Trustee D'Souza. Sure. All in favor? Further discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Item number four, presentations. And tonight we uh, have proclamations for the Boulder County Youth Corps, which is very exciting. And Director Dominguez, if you would give us some information. Juanita Dominguez, Director of Parks, Recreation, and Open Space. 
Uh, each year we have uh, one crew from the Boulder County Youth Corps help us out with various items such as uh, trail uh, improvements, uh, trail development, and uh, painting, and of course weed control. Um, this year we had a, a, a full group. Um, it had, they had their challenges this year, coming down with the flu, um, losing about a week's work. Um, a couple of kids were out a, co a couple of days. Um, however, they were able to uh, accomplish quite a bit. Um, tonight we have five individuals here, as well as Judy Wolf, the program coordinator. So I'd like to um, just really, um, you know, thank them for all the help they do with us each year. We've got a couple kids that are um, on their second year today, but Mayor, if you could read the proclamation, then we'll have the kids come up individually so we can take pictures. That'd be great. And um, did Miss Wolf want to? Add anything to this at all? No, we're just very thankful that you have a senior recently. Great. Well, we're excited that they're here. So, with that, I'd like to read a proclamation of the Board of Trustees of the Town of Superior in appreciation of the Boulder County Youth Corps. Whereas the Boulder County Youth Corps is commended for their dedicated efforts to help our community, uh, make our community a better place to live, and the Town of Superior has supported the Boulder County Youth Corps since 2004 by coordinating, coordinating necessary parks and open space projects and during their eight week tour this team worked 2,496 hours were involved with several projects. The team top dressed soft trails in the town totaling 4,868 feet, um, nearly one mile using a total of 300 tons, 310 tons of material which is, uh, I'm sort of thinking about that. They installed 20 new water bars and uh, rehabilitated others for erosion control along the trails. They removed silt fencing and hay bales from open space areas left from previous construction, pulled trash and debris from the drainage ways and creeks throughout Rock Creek, and they removed toad flax, covering an area of approximately eight acres in various locations. They repainted shelters, handrails, and bike racks over 1,200 feet of fence. And therefore, I, Andrew Muckle, Mayor of the Town of Superior, and the Board of Trustees do hereby proclaim its appreciation to the Boulder County Youth Corps for the significant uh, contribution to the community, in particular for, so I'm going to. Uh, I can do it. You want to do that? Okay. Because I was getting ready to butcher a whole bunch of names, and I was going to apologize. So, Director Dominguez, thank you very much. So, what we'd like to do at this time is um, have each one of the children come up as I uh, call their name. And, and Young adults, you have to be careful. Young adults, I know. <laughs> they are not here. Uh, the first is Abdullah Had Pasha. Second is Christopher Gray. Andrew Eberhard. Christian Valentine. Julia Jonitis. And Roshana Henderson. There are several individuals who are not here. Um, I would like to read off their names as well. Uh, Daniel Stechman, Katie Olivas, Yulia Levertova, Patricia Seward, Eric Lutz, 
and that's it. But if we can have everybody come up here real quick and have one group picture, that would be great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thanks very much. I mean, it's really, uh, you know, people worry about how the future is going to be. And if they're in our young use hands here, I think that we're pretty confident about how that's going to be. So thanks very much, and we really appreciate it. Uh, let's see. So with that, we need to move to item number five, which is public comment on consent agenda and non-agenda items. <laughs> thanks again. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Hello. Um, my, my name is Laura Kirkman. I'm at 2855 Rock Creek Circle, and I'm here representing the Superior Mustangs Youth Football League. Uh, one of the things, well, what we'd like to talk about um, to propose to you all is to get a scoreboard on the turf field over there in Colton. And we have talked to the ProStat committee and given them some information about the scoreboard. One of the things that we had um, let them know that we would do is try to find a sponsor, since it is expensive um, to get a scoreboard. We understand that. Um, and especially with how tough the times have been, we were really worried about being able to get a sponsor. Um, but the good news is that we did find one sponsor that is willing to pay for the entire scoreboard. Wow. Um, which is about uh, eighty-nine or sorry, eighty-five hundred dollars. Um, what we are requesting from the town is to actually pay for the installation of the scoreboard, um, and then the scoreboard would be owned, operated, and maintained by the town. So it would be a town scoreboard. It would not just be owned by the Mustangs. Um, the scoreboard is such that it will definitely be um, usable by other sports. So it's not just for football, we did make sure that it's uh, generic, but it'll fit for soccer and lacrosse and for football, so certainly all those different sports that use the field could uh, could use it. Um, so we did find a, a sponsor, it's Covidian, they're a healthcare company, um, they used to be Tyco, if you knew that company, um, but really I, I think if we could take advantage of the fact that we do have a sponsor, we only have one sponsor, because we were really worried that we would have to get multiples. And you know, aesthetically, it looks great that there's only one sponsor name that has to be on the scoreboard. I, I didn't bring anything to put up on the projector, but I can show you um, a picture of what the scoreboard would look like. That's the rendering that we had um, created. And you see it does say Williams Field, home of the Mustangs. We would like that recognition for getting the sponsorship. Um, and you will see there is a small Mustangs logo and then also a Town of Superior logo um, that would be on the scoreboard. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, great. Thank you. That would be wonderful. Um, and then you'll see at the bottom, uh, the length of the scoreboard is filled with, uh, for Covidian specifically, it has their logo um, and name on it. Thank you so much. What is the cost for the installation? Do you know? Do you um, what we're looking at is it's about five to seven thousand dollars from what we saw. Um, so I don't know if you'd be able to find something less expensive, but that's uh, with the research that we looked at. It's about five to seven thousand um, dollars. I think most of that is the electrical that would need to go in, because um, what we're proposing is to put the scoreboard on the north side of the field, which would then face the parking lot. Um, and the size of the lights, uh, what we have been told is that it would only be, be clearly seen from the first row of the of the parking lot and in. So it wouldn't wouldn't be that bright to be outside of that area. Um, the scoreboard is about 16 feet high, so it would be on, we would like it on the north north side of the field, so that everyone in the field could see it. And then it would actually have. What we looked at with the price is to have two wireless controllers, one that we would like to keep um, on the field in the shed locked up, um, that the Mustangs can uh, have the key to that, and then also to give one uh, that the town would, would store. So you're talking about um, 
putting it on the very north end of the field, how? It would be on the corner, so it wouldn't be um, in back of the end zone. And actually, I can do this. Here's the football field, and it would be about right here, facing diagonal towards the south end. And so how would that impact the homes that are right there? Do you know? Um, it's shorter than, we did talk about it in the post act committee, I believe. Um, it is shorter than the other lights that are there. Um, and it would, the back of it would be, would be facing the homes, so they wouldn't have any additional lights going towards the homes. It would be the opposite direction. Okay, would it block any of their view of any of the um, parks? Because it's a little bit slanted, I don't think that it would too much. I mean, there may, you know, they're, they're going to see the scoreboard a little bit, uh, but um, I think even the trees are, are taller than what you would see. Uh, so I don't really know that you could see the scoreboard very easily through the trees. Trustee D'Souza. And um, do you have any idea of what the maintenance costs, the operational yeah, costs yeah. of that would be? Uh, no, I don't. Or, um, I think just paying for the electrical, and then I guess if anything was to was to need maintenance, but no, I don't know. I, I could definitely tell you who our, um, I have the information here about who the um, person, the company is that does the scoreboard, so, you know, we could find out for you if you want what the average maintenance would be. I was just wondering if there's a service that you have to purchase for maintenance or any type of thing like that, or um, is it just, it we would be We did not see that in our research with that. Okay. Other questions or comments? Uh, my comment is, I've, well, anybody from Prostac would like to make a comment? <laughs> <laughs> Jim Payne, 2475 Clayton Circle. I'm the Prostac chair. Uh, just to remind the board, uh, this has come before you before. It was actually in our, uh, in our budget approved in 2009 using CTF, um, Conservation Trust Fund money. Uh, so some was put aside to to match this to do exactly what they're proposing. And um, we also gave you a heads up about this about two months ago, I think. So uh, if it sounds familiar, it's exactly what we've been working on. And we Great. support it. I do have a question. What is the time frame we're looking at? They're, the reason they're here tonight is so we can move forward and get it in place for this season. That's, that's why they're here. Otherwise, it wouldn't even be in a public comment. But they wanted to, couldn't wait till next meeting, we'd like to move forward, so they were asked to come and make public comment tonight. The first game is end of August. So we're aware that it may not be up by the first game, but we would like it to put in the job this season, if possible. And it, it does take two weeks to order the actual <coughs> Other comments or questions? Trustee Skumatz? This so you're saying this doesn't go through staff to us? You, you, you want us to vote on it based on the um, public comment period? I don't think so. So okay. let, let me just make some comments. So the answer to that one is no, we can't uh, yeah. vote on that tonight yeah. without it's having a report. So what, what you just said, but we just want to get it on the table. Yeah. Can, can right I, now. The you the board had asked. Um, some of you weren't here, so if some of you don't remember it, I know it was a full meeting. Um, had asked that you wanted to see the design when it was ready to go. Um, I don't know if there are any other approvals that are necessary, but that was the board's request. So that's why we it was felt necessary to come back and show the student. Okay. So my comments are I think it's a great idea. I think it would be a nice addition to the field. Um, I, you know, it's uh, it's good for the community, uh, you, and multiple sports can use it. It's great that Convidian is stepping up, and they've been a very good partner in our community for many different reasons, and it's nice to see that they're doing this as well. Uh, you know, the board would need to know the real costs up front, uh, so we probably have to, well, I'll leave this to uh, staff to do whatever you think is appropriate. I assume our engineers would have to look at this, and we'd have to understand what the wiring would be and understanding what the real cost would be. It, it would be very beneficial to have some sort of uh, general photo sim of what it would look like from the south part of the field. I think that would give people a lot of comfort level. I think the trees are much higher than that's what's anticipated for the scoreboard. And the lights, for sure, are, are a whole bunch taller. So I, I don't think it would really be seen by anybody. Um, so I'm going to give general staff direction unless I have 
some big naysayers uh, to work on this and expedite it as much as possible, understanding that staff has other things on their plate and you know we can't commit to any particular timeline. We'd love to see it love to see it up tomorrow if it would work, but that's clearly not gonna happen. So um, Mr. Randall, you know, you can either tell us whether or not you think that's gonna be within two weeks or a month, but uh, you don't have to make that decision tonight. Just we'll certainly point. provide you with the information that you've asked for. Uh, the whole concept is consistent with, as Mr. Payne indicated, uh, the work program and the CTF fund budget requests that you had seen, uh, that there was money set aside for this kind of, a, of an improvement. The board's guidance at that point, I believe it was late January or early February, was we're fine with the improvement, but we're not comfortable in making the, uh, making the investment. Go find financing for it and they've come back with at least half of it there's the structure whether it includes the installation I think it was always understood because of the multiple uses of the field uh, that it was going to be town owned maintained that was an obligation that we would as we would absorb uh, installation is a new one but let us get get some numbers together as quickly as we possibly can uh, the fact that you don't meet for three more well, I guess two more weeks we'll do our best to get it in front of you as quickly as possible Thank you, Trustee Scomatz. And, and my only other question is whether there's, um, whether staff, whether the placement that's being proposed is optimal or not. And so that's the first something staff would look at. It. Yeah, we okay. will. And that's what the photo sim and Trustee Susan. And I, mine follows along with that, just to make sure. Um, that I don't know if, the, if this company has done a lot of local installations or not, and just aware of the wind issues that we have here. Okay, it is Zantac uh, is the company, but we can talk about it. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Additional public comment on consent agenda and non-agenda items. Welcome, George. George Kutner, 109 South Fourth. Good evening, Board. Is there any way we can get some hotel pins for sound? Look at where you're sitting from your sound systems. It's, we pay to have this taped so people can hear it. I can't hardly hear you, Mayor, sitting right here in the front row, and I got a hearing aid on. Is there any way we could do something about the sound system? If you can do everything else, it's about time to do something with the sound system in this room. Please. Okay. Uh, that's just a suggestion I've suggested before. Uh, another thing I want to suggest is it possible of getting the agenda printed up one day earlier or two days earlier. As it is now, it doesn't give the citizens enough time to pick up their packet on Thursday, look at it on Friday, Saturday you're closed, Sunday you're closed, Monday you come back, we work, we all work, you know. Uh, it's not giving us enough time to pass this agenda around. I pass mine around to different people that, that like to see it, that certain things coming up, you know. But it's just not impossible for two days to do it. That's now we used to have it on Wednesdays. Any possibility of getting this uh, returned so we, because the town is in a, in a rush to, Pass all this stuff immediately. We like to digest some of what you, you're doing. Okay. So uh, the issue, George. So this has been bantered about, although we haven't talked about it recently. Uh, the advantage of having it on Wednesdays, the you know the board used to have it at that time. So you know we get the packet when you get the packet. Uh, we have the same time frame to go over it as you do. Correct. Uh, the disadvantage of putting it earlier is that you frequently might have not have all the information for the packet. Um, so this was the happy medium that we struck. It wasn't Friday because that was late, and it wasn't Tuesday when we wouldn't have enough information. So personally, I, I think it's probably going to stay on Thursday. So, and so. I understand that people want to look at it work. I think we all work up here as well. So you know, it's a, it's a balancing act that we need to come up with. Well, it worked out on Wednesday just fine. One day ain't going to hurt, kill you. To move it up one day, I'm going to tell you right now. Okay. Uh, next thing. They never repaired the hole up there, the bad hole on 4th Street and uh, Marshall Road. Okay, once again, yeah, you know, George, so I had... Uh, the uh, town public work director has disappeared from the scene here, which is okay with me. Uh, All right, need so, so George, I just... Taken care. I, so, once again, we uh, it would be best if we you could bring up some of those items prior to the meeting. I'm bringing this it up now, Mayor. You know, this is the only time I've got to bring it up. I work just like you do every day. Okay. We... we now, those okay, are questions so that we can't answer, so. I got another one before here, my time runs out. Is there any possible way to get an agenda item C put on, uh, we got reports of issues 
at 7.30, that's how it says. And we got the mayor and the board members, manager, attorney, clerk, is there any way to get a public input on that? Because you all go to different meetings, like Dr. Cobb, you go to the Soil in Boulder. And I sit out here and I don't have an opportunity, you know, people, to, not only me, have an opportunity to ask questions about what you people are doing since your service as a board. And I would enjoy very much if you could just, even limit it to two minutes or, or three minutes, so the public would have a recourse on what you people are doing. You know what I'm saying? Me, you can't if I have a question. Uh, so you, just so uh, I understand, so just so I understand, what you're suggesting is basically moving reports, questions, and issues before public comment. Public comment. Prior to public comment, is that what you're suggesting? Well, I'm talking about down here on the report. Right, right. Uh, okay. I still right. would like to have the, the uh, public comment before the meeting because uh, some people are older, like I am. Sometimes they don't like to stay until ten o'clock. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so, that's interesting that's idea. That that I think we've talked about it from time to time. Because so. there's not many people here at the end of the meeting, one or two. We might have a few tonight, which is fine. I'd like to see more people down here. That's our communication gap because we ain't got people here. Okay. Uh, All right. That's an interesting thing. I want to get on this uh, agenda item number C, please. We got the, presented by Scott Randall, town manager. He's presenting his own contract here. I think that's wrong. I think the mayor should have presented that. I think that uh, Mayor Pro Tem or the attorney. I don't think it's right for him to have be presenting a contract here. His own. You might agree to it. And you might talk on the phone about it. And you might email each other about it. But people don't know until they pick this up and know what's coming off. So, uh, I think that's wrong. Number one is, I see you're giving you $5,000 performance bond. What's this for? Give me an answer. Uh, $5,000 is 4% of his wages, okay? Right, so the performance is due to the outstanding performance over the last year. That's your opinion? That's correct. What about other people's opinions? How, uh, how can they get to express these out? And you know what my opinion is. And you yes, I do. Come back. No, wait a minute. That is all of it. You come back and give him there's another two percent from fifteen to seventeen. That's six percent increase right there. Man, it's the economy the way it is. Six percent plus fifteen hundred dollar fee for another uh, deal back here. That's that's not right, people. Okay. But people have some say so in this town. That that's why we're citizens here, citizens here, and that's why we live here. It's so we can have some input in this town. Not, 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 we're not doing town business down here, just town. I'm telling you right now, we're doing it other means. At least it don't look like that. You all I don't, I don't understand. Understand. I understand what you you're talking about. You all these things before it ever gets here. Okay. All right, George. Yeah, just let me see if I have anything else just about done here. I don't Since, know. I don't uh, you understand what I'm talking about there. Uh, are we planning on putting in the budget anything about doing anything with Cold Creek Drive? It's like a washboard. It's been terrible since the day you put it in and approved it, and, and you're one of them, and I can name a few more. Drive it sometime in the daytime, like I do every day, two or three times. I do go to Conoco, get paper and coat, whatever. Drive it. I do. I think all of us do. We do. It needs resurfaced just like they did in Rock Creek. Okay. Done right. And I do enjoy your bike trail down on the south end of town and your walking path, 23 feet. From, from Douglas to uh, Marcus Drive, which is a railroad track. Okay. That's what it's made for. All right. Thank you. Additional public comment? I'm Megan McDonald. I live at 2056 Emerson Lane. And uh, with school starting, I just wanted to talk with you a little bit about the cross section. I think Deborah Williams, Trustee Williams, brought that up a while ago at El Dorado in Indiana. I'm one of the parents who um, walks literally every day, rain, except for the windy days. 
And um, my kids have had a lot of dangerous uh, encounters with vehicles in the crosswalk. They, they do, honestly don't stop, and I know this was mentioned, and I really appreciate that. So the, the reason I came down today is not just to say, please make the car stop, because I haven't figured out how to do that. I've yelled at them. I've <laughs> pleaded with them. I've watched kids nearly get run over as cars rev their engines impatiently to watch kids walk across, and especially the little ones. I have smaller ones. They don't always cross and then go straight across. Sometimes they drop a feather or something that they go back for. Um, the reason I came down here tonight is just to ask that the school zone be extended before the crosswalk because the problem is people don't start thinking about the fact that they need to be school zone conscious yeah. until they get through the, cross, the crosswalk. So they'll zoom across the intersection and then put the brakes on and wait, either because there's a line or there's a, um, a school zone sign. The school zone starts heading... Um, I'm coming from the, I guess that's the south to the north of the school. And I guess the, if that were to be adjusted, I think that that might change behavior. And I haven't really come up with any other suggestions or ideas that might assist us with that. But I, I think it's a really tangible thing to do. I don't know what the process would be to make that happen. But as school's approaching, I'm anxious to see a solution other than, you know, me and the kids trying to test our luck. So you're saying extending it on Indiana further to the south? Further, further to the south. Before you approach the intersection. So before the crosswalks, if the school zone were on the other side, I think people might... So now it starts around the speed bump. It starts just before the entrance to the parking lot. All right. And it just, it, so it seems that most there. school zones are usually yeah. further out. And it's not Which consistent with the other crosswalk either. And we did extend it out on the other, on Mount Sopra, so I don't see. We did, we did That's it out right. in Indiana we in front of El Dorado. We did. Yeah. We yeah. Yeah. This is, I'm sorry, I didn't clarify. This is superior element. Un yeah. Oh, we do know so that. that. <laughs> we, we do the same oh, thing no, by no, moving, I extending the school speed zone to a broader area. Okay. Yeah. It yeah, I like think that. just including the crosswalk would make a huge difference. I think seems like that. Uh, speaking as a I crossing guard, I thought we discussed guard, this. Yeah. Uh, who enjoy my crossing guard duty on a regular basis? Uh, yeah, it probably doesn't make sense. Yes, uh, probably doesn't make sense to have the school zone after the stop sign. So I assume that probably could come to fruition. I'm looking. Okay. Yep. But is that going to? Oh. So my other comment, speaking as a regular crossing guard, is that the people usually running through the stop sign are the parents going to the school. <laughs> Do you want me to answer that, honestly? <laughs> um, it's everything. I mean, it's, I've encountered everything. I've encountered, I mean, watching other children from our neighborhood crossing mm -hmm. and having cars just hit the brakes. I've seen distracted parents. Parents who are late and don't think. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to change human behavior. I just want to try yeah. to make it the safest because at this point, my kids aren't going to walk across mm -hmm. on their own. And I guess my only other comment, speaking as a crossing guard who enjoys his crossing guard duty at the speed bump, uh, you know, the more parents that we can be, you know, parents with young children, that's not going to happen, but people, parents with older children in the school, as many crossing guards as possible, this would be my public uh, plea uh, when the school starts, uh, I think it's very helpful because they really see the parents out in yeah. the crosswalks. And we don't have cross crossing guards currently, Correct, and I right. think it's being discussed. Yeah. And, uh, and Trustee uh, Skumets. Yes. Yeah. So, in theory, I'm in, I'm in favor of it. My only question is then, does that mean it also extends on El Dorado in both directions as well? Because if you're talking about cross crosswalks, mm -hmm. there's crosswalks mm -hmm. on four sides of that block. So are you talking about bringing school zones in from three, I'd three sides? I'd say 90% of the problem is Indiana. Mm -hmm. Okay. I really, I mean, not that we don't encounter that, mm -hmm. but I mean, truly, I, I think we walked five days maybe last, I mean, didn't walk five days last last year due to wind. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's cold, yeah. you put on a jacket, but it's mostly on Indiana. <laughs> In, on Indiana, on the north side, Right. how far does the school zone start where? Goes like Rock Creek Parkway? Yeah, it goes around the corner and almost to that speed sign that flashes at you. It goes beyond So it extends Creek quite Parkway. a bit on that side. Yes, it, it does. Past the tennis courts, past the swimming pool. It goes yeah. past yeah. the intersection. Around the corner. Right. Mm -hmm. Goes past the intersection. And, uh, and one, one, one easy fix. Yeah, easy fix. Uh, and one Thank ticket you. in a school zone where you have to, I believe, show up in court, maybe. <gasps> um, that might have changed recently, but it's. Uh, it did was, change. That was my hope. It yeah, did change. The, the uh, court appearance is no longer mandatory, but the fine schedule is still double for any 
uh, infractions within a, within a school zone. Yeah, and so they're using infractions on a daily basis. Good, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, people get pulled over whether on Rock Creek Parkway or just immediately on mm -hmm. Indiana on that side anyway. I don't know if it's enforced on the other side, the one you're to talking honest, about. It's not. Seen not too often. On the yeah. Creek Park yeah. There it's not. Yeah. I think they're, yeah. I think they're concentrating on speeding on right. Rock Creek. Yeah. Um, actually, I brought this up on the, I was on the school improvement team of the SIT committee over at Superior, and that was something that they brought up that I did bring forward that we would talk about at a safety Transportation. Tra yeah, yeah, exactly, transportation and safety anyways, meeting. So. And um, I don't know if we have met since, but yeah. that was pretty much at the end of the school year. Okay. Yeah, um, but anticipating with school starting yeah. next week trying to get things done. So. But that was the number one thing that was brought up that they were hoping to look at with the city. So we can either have TSC look at this or we can make a command decision. Staff can make a command decision, I suspect. Excellent idea. Thank you I'm very seeing much. seeing head nods and yeah. TSC has endorsed it and we'll have it done before school starts. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think so. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. Appreciate thank you. it. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Additional public comment on consent that. agenda and non-agenda items. Uh, uh, Steve Smith, 653 Eaton Circle. Is 6C a foregone conclusion? It reads like it's already decided. It's on the consent it's, agenda. Yes. So does it go to vote tonight, or is it something that you're... The uh, consent agenda vote? goes to vote. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you're going to determine if you're going to go ahead and add on to the... Correct. Contract. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Additional public comment on consent agenda and non-agenda items. Thank you for your photography. Uh, then item number six is consent agenda, and on the consent agenda tonight is the approval of the minutes for July 27, 2009 meetings. Preliminary reading of an ordinance for the rezoning of the resolute property, adoption of a resolution approving an employment agreement for the town manager, approval of a recommendation to Boulder County regarding potential future open space acquisition and trail requests. Motion by Trustee Skumatz, second by Trustee Gregoris. Discussion? Trustee Skumatz? Yes, I, um, if I can, I'd like to abstain to what extent I can from the minutes, and also I wasn't part of crafting C. Part of what? Crafting, crafting C. C. Oh, yeah. Okay. Additional public comment? Um, comment? Um, Williams, sorry. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to clarify on uh, consent agenda B uh, that we are not approving any zoning at this time. We are just doing a preliminary reading, correct? Correct. First reading, two readings are required. You're also scheduling a public hearing for your next meeting, after which, at some point, the board would be free to take action, final action. Okay, and then um, I was kind of confused with the cons. Uh, property rezoned prior to final plat site plan submittal. That's a con. And um, does that mean that our upfront obligations by the town on the approval of the final plat is different because it is not part of the entire zoning process? No, or? You, typically you would see the final plan and rezone at the same time because they don't have a development project yet have a hotel, they don't have an office, they don't have a prospective real uh, retailer for one or more of the proposed retail pads. Typically you would see those at the same time. They're asking, and they asked when they came forward last February, to consider four things. Uh, this is one of those four things, which would give them the authority to market it to a broader extent of use. But you don't have, you don't have a specific development plan like you typically would. And I go back to another one, even though it was an annexation, Guardian Storage. You were annexing it, you were zoning it, you were platting it, and you knew what was going to be built, and you saw it all at the same time. You don't have that luxury at this point. But we wanted to show our support for the, for the redevelopment by giving the rezoning, by allowing them a broader list of uses, and recognizing up front that that broader list of uses will, will have extra building height. The board, em the board embraced it at the time when they came forward with their conceptual plan in February, uh, and the Planning Commission is, fav is recommending favorably. But we wanted the list. That typically, you'd look at all of this as a package. You're not looking at a package. You're only looking at the zone. Uh, Trustee Skumas, but um, if, if I could just for uh, would you mind, now that we've had this long discussion about this property, 
for those who are interested and might be confused about what we're talking about, could you uh, rewind? Well, and the Resolute the property is located on the north side of Colton between Tyler and Flatirons Boulevard, effectively Flatirons Mall. Uh, it is the undeveloped parcel that for many, many years has been owned by the Horizons Apartment Complex, Simpson Properties out of Atlanta. It has always been zoned and anticipated since the beginning of the Rock Creek Ranch PUD and even while it was owned by Simpson Property to be commercial. Within the last year to year and a half, they've sold the property and they sold it to a uh, Denver-based developer called Resolute Investment. Resolute Investment has come forward on two different occasions with conceptual plans for the board and the Planning Commission to look at. Uh, the first one was warmly received um, with a couple of modifications. The second one was enthusiastically received, which was the one that called for a hotel, a couple of office buildings, and some retail pads on the entire 14-acre parcel. So that's the, air, the geographic area and a little bit of the history of the property that we're talking about. The action that's before the board now is the first reading, preliminary approval, of an ordinance that would rezone that property from CAC, Commercial Activity, uh, or Community Activity Center, to RAC, or Regional Activity Center. And the difference between those two zoning classifications is the list of potential commercial uses is broader under the RAC as is the building density and building height. It allows for taller buildings in the RAC than what the CAC would have allowed. And again, the board has long embraced uh, extensive mixed-use development at that particular location. So, and it encouraged the applicant to make this, uh, to proceed with this approval uh, back in February. Thank you for the synopsis. Justice Skumas. So this is next to the mall, basically. Yes. Um, I'm just trying to make it simple. North of blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, uh, the other thing I want to say is, that, and, and I think from what I understand, while we usually get things all at once, this in no way presumes the next step. We still have approval of every single step out yep. of them. I just want to make that clear to everybody. Yep. And in a way, in, in my opinion, I'm not sure I see it as a con. I, I see it as a positive being that it's um, something that the public can follow instead of having it all tied together. But the that's just my opinion. Okay. Thank you. Additional comments about the consent agenda? Seeing none, uh, I think we have a motion and a second. Dan Phillips? Yes. Ms. Susan? Yes. Sorelli? Yes. Michael? Yes. Schumacher? Yes on B and D, abstain on A and C if possible. Okay. Williams? Yes. Okay. Motion carries. Thank you very much. With that, uh, item number seven, reports, questions, and issues. Um, Trustee Sorelli, do you want to start? I, I really have nothing. Trustee Um Let's see. I um, went to a library committee meeting a bit ago, and I have to say that and I missed one while I was um, absent. It was... Um, it was partly because I didn't understand that it was a there was a meeting because it, the memo came the email came from like Buddy and Joni or something like that and I didn't understand that that was something meetingy so <laughs> I thought it was junk mail so anyway that was a problem but in any case um, one I, I appreciate being appointed to that committee the one negative associate that Louisville Library Committee is that it's a committee that's got really unclear authority it doesn't seem to like run the library it doesn't seem to it's sort of like advisory a step or two removed and so I'm not sure I, I don't feel like it's got a lot of um, to it but I'll, I'll continue to go as long as you know and and try to provide as much input as I can but it sort of doesn't it's not it's not a it's a it's a little bit of a mushy um, authority I think okay, okay. Um, Let's see. I wanted to make to give a heads up to the citizens and to um, the board and everybody about that round two of the Climate Wise Loan Program is starting to warm up, and so watch out for this time. Superior was embarrassingly low last time. We were the lowest of anybody in Boulder County in terms of percents of and percent per capita and all that sort of stuff for applying for that loan. It's a really important program where the you, it makes it so that that you can invest in things with a longer payback because it's paid back by the property, not by the person <coughs> who currently owns the property. It stays with your house. If it's a 20-year payback, it's a tw you know, 20 years, it comes back out of that house. So it's kind of 
um, important. And so watch out for that. There'll be, I assume, another round of workshops and all that as there was before. But it's a really important program, and it's actually groundbreaking in the country, and it's a way to get millions of dollars of, of energy efficiency into the market right fast. It includes residential and commercial. Um, I went to the Consortium of Cities meeting, and um, we had a, we um, uh, we're, just, we're looking at what, what are the main um, issues that we're going to be looking at. One of the things that came up was a health and human services um, program that, that, that they're, that they're uh, looking at, and I guess I'll, when we get something concrete, I'll bring that back. When we went around and had each of the communities talk, though, it was interesting to find that one or two of the communities were, that were having particular um, budget crunches were instituting what, they were, or instituting what they're calling quality of life fees to cover things related to um, environmental stuff, uh, a whole host of, of things, and calling it a fee as opposed to other things that require more approval. That was interest. I'm not advocating. I'm just putting it out there as a, a, a item of interest. Had a coffee buzz this last weekend that didn't have a lot of attendees. I think it was a good camping weekend for everybody. <laughs> um, and then um, I wanted to throw out one other thing, and that was oh, and and, and I'm um, the I've heard really good reports about the Sierra Club energy efficiency workshops that that were available to citizens, and so that was I'm really glad that those are moving forward. I'm happy we have the town participating. The last thing I want to mention is a little thing I'm going to throw out there. When people did not not react yet, but think about, <laughs> I'm very interested in getting Superior to have a little bit more. Um, you know, people still are. You know, you talk to people, and they still don't know where Superior is, and, and all that sort of thing. I'd like to have more of an identity. Well, number thirteen. What do you mean? I <laughs> know, isn't that great? Yeah. It's great, but um, I, that's one of the reasons for that that discussion about the library earlier. But the other thing I want to, people to consider is, what if we renamed our part of McCaslin Superior Boulevard? So think about it. So that would we own it. We already have to, you know, maintain it. Why not? Yes, make it part of our identity. It doesn't. None of the buildings along there have to change addresses because nobody really has a McCaslin address. Maybe one building, but not much. So, so that would be from 128th to the freeway. That's what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. Why not? I say. Okay. Next statement. Well, that's an interesting thought. Thank you. Anything else? I'm done. Uh, let's see, I'll go. Um, I was out of town, uh, missed uh, being in the town of Superior. You, being the uh, government geek that I am, I you know watch the CAC channels and the other towns that I were, was in and uh, read the <laughs> local government well, issues. That's bad on vacation. I yeah. know. Uh, so I, I'm owning up to that. Uh, but after doing that, I'd, I'd say that we live in a great town that's run well that uh, was happy to come home to. So. Um, the only thing that I found that was that perhaps we could do a little bit better that I saw was our Channel 8. They, uh, other places have maybe better use of that. They have more. We have a lot of information on there that's really hard to read, and uh, so I think that we might be able to improve the quality of that. I'm not. I don't want to say anything bad about the people that have been working on it, but I think that there's they have interesting things like the. The temperature and the time and things, you know, just other more, you know, I, I think a lot of people are probably not, after they've looked at it for 15 seconds, are probably done with our Channel 8 and anything that could engage uh, people in that, well, a little bit more would be probably helpful. But that being said, I think that we definitely, uh, after seeing all these places around, uh, well, in Canada and around the rest of the country here, that uh, we live in number 13 and, and as the manager said with a bullet I think we're going for bigger and better things so it's great to be back. Trustee D'Souza. Nothing to report. Okay. Trustee Gregoris. Uh, just a couple of items. One question and one comment. As a member of the uh, Safety and Transportation Committee I would strongly be in favor of extending the uh, um, school zone. I think so. I think it's fair. It's extended quite a bit on the other side, on the north side, so I think it's fair to extend it a little bit more on the south side. And from the uh, August 6th uh, Weekly Digest, I have a question about the item under William's estate. It says that a lawsuit was filed and the town's defense is being provided by Travelers Insurance, our liability insurance carrier. What, 
you've lost it. I'm, I may have missed something. There was. I would encourage you to go back and look at a previous item on that issue. Okay. But there has been a lawsuit filed. I guess that's down. And um, not to be too. Uh, well, let's see. How much of this is yeah, exactly uh, public? Oh, most of, most the of suit is public. The suit is public. The suit is public so, yeah. uh, can it's you describe public. briefly what it is? So it's not a in, in twenty not words, in twenty in twenty words or less. The claim yes. the claim is that an insurance policy that the town promised and paid for was never paid on, and not that the town didn't pay. The town the paid. The town, the town was obligated to provide continued life insurance. We provided that life insurance, paid the premiums for that life insurance, the claim for that life insurance was denied. Our, our perspective is it's a matter between the estate and that insurance company. Okay. All right. That's what I need to know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I will provide you a confidential update as we know a little bit more about the case. Right now, we're still working on whether or not it's covered by the town's insurance and what attorney will be defending the case. As soon as that happens, we'll give you a better and more detailed update. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Trustee Williams. Well, um, school is starting mid next week, and so is the school improvement team meetings uh, at Superior and El Dorado, the schools that are in our town. And um, I would like to continue being a town representative and show our goodwill towards both the schools um, and bring anything forward that they have any concerns or just report on it in general. That would be great. And that's all I've got. Okay. Thank and you very uh, much. I think I uh, mentioned also that if time permitting and if your time doesn't allow, I'd be happy to participate in those. I think they're very helpful. They're part of the reason that uh, we're number 13 with a bullet going up is because <laughs> the quality of our schools and doing everything that we can do to help out with them is very helpful. And, and I would be willing to back you up. <laughs> okay. uh, That's not what I'm volunteering for. <laughs> 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 I'll be the fourth backup. Okay. Um, I did forget one thing about the consortium and, come in and, and seeing that um, Mr. Randall's next, so um, reminded me. So one of the things that the consortium is thinking about working on this year is an important thing, especially in this down economy, is looking at whether there are appropriate options for service sharing and that sort of thing between communities in Boulder County. Um, you know, whether that's we go out for a joint contract for XYZ or something and get really great deals on it or something like that. That may be one of the things. One of the first steps toward that was the consortium thought it might be good to have, um, to suggest a meeting among the various town managers in the county to think about what are some things that might get to, just to brainstorm about what things might make, might be appropriate. If we're interested in having our town manager spend a little bit of time attending one of those meetings, that's what I was sort of looking for a head nod, and um, that's, I forgot to mention that. Thank you. I suspect the town manager attends those meetings already to some degree. We've had some discussions amongst the managers themselves on revenue sharing and some of the other items selectively that come up at the, at the consortium. That's one that not, I'd be very interested in, in participating in. In fact, Mayor, maybe you and I could dust off our plan for yep. Mega City. <laughs> yes. Superior. Superiorville. Yes. Luperior. Yeah. yeah. All right. Great. Thank you. Interesting concept, Mr. Randall. Very briefly. Um, first, kudos to the to the Boulder County Sheriff's Department for an extraordinary event last Tuesday night. Uh, Superior's inaugural effort at participating in the National Light at Night Out program. Uh, I was concerned because of the last minute nature of it. It was incredibly well attended, not quite as, as large as Chili Fest or some of our other events, but for a first time effort and recognizing that it was geared towards uh, neighborhood crime prevention and the like, uh, uh, an, an extraordinary turnout and kudos again to everybody that was involved in it. Uh, we are continuing to solicit interested volunteers for the board's home rule task force. Uh, we've got some letters that have gone out for people that have been suggested to see if they have any interest in it. Uh, it'll be mentioned in the September issue of the newsletter. I do anticipate bringing it before the board uh, for appointments to that particular task force at, at your first meeting in September. Um, 
the web page task force, which is was being driven by staff, uh, has at least four members already. Unfortunately, because of school vacations, we haven't been able to convene the first meeting. We do anticipate that it'll it'll be held the first of September. Um, but Trustee Williams, Trustee Rosenfeld, and Mr. Halverson from the uh, HOA have volunteered to participate on it. Uh, Probably have received information about the pool uh, pools schedules being modified as of Monday with the opening reopening of schools, and at long last our newest restaurant has opened. Today was their first official day. I understand that they had a soft opening as, re as early as Friday, but without any fanfare today was actually their first day uh, of business. And that and that's looking at businesses. Creek. Pizza and dough, and filling the old space uh, previously occupied by Serrano's. Uh, and my only suggestion to them, which I think they've taken, was feed the parents of the Mustangs as they're sitting in the bleachers, because that's a huge constituency in the coming months. Uh, but hopefully they'll be taking it up, and hopefully they'll be as successful as the Colorado Walk has been in that space that they've recently reoccupied. That's all I have. And part of our. Uh Business retention plan. We like to welcome those businesses into our community as part of our newsletter. They will be in. Yep, in the September issue. Ms. Carberry. Don't have anything. Thank you. Ms. Harden. I don't have anything. All right. Ask. Oh yeah. Susan, I was thinking about to have a transportation safety meeting again. For meeting meeting, uh, it, we took the summer off, but now with school starting again, might be a good idea to have it maybe on the twenty fourth. Um, so we usually do it before the work session, so maybe five. I'll see if, if people are available. There's a five o'clock, or we'll have our new public works director on. Right, exactly. It'd be good. One week. Okay. So it'll be good to meet him and share some of our concerns with him. And uh, anything else to come before the board? Say not. Being a Thank you.